Money with the right attitude creates thriving communities. I'm sure you can recall a time when you were young and your parents were trying to change your attitude. They might have told you not to jump off the roof because they were afraid you might break your leg or suffer a severe head injury. Or they'd already forbade you from going to that house party down the street and told you not to sneak out of your bedroom window during the middle of the night because they knew they'd have to ground you for homecoming, the prom, or who knows, maybe even the rest of your life. Your parents were simply trying to change your attitude so they could ensure that you would have the best life outcomes. Hello, I'm Calvin Holmes, president of the Chicago Community Loan Fund. And for the past 25 years, I've been working to change people's attitude about money so they could make long-term investments to lift people out of poverty. I'm not entirely sure how I came to a career in transforming communities. Maybe I got it honest. When I was a kid, my mother and grandmother worked to build wealth for the low-income residents of East St. Louis, Illinois, my hometown, which is about 300 miles southwest of Chicago. And then when I came to college here in Chicago, I started putting two and two together, that what they were doing then was related to how investments can improve neighborhoods, that when you combine public and private investment in a low-income community, wealth follows. And when it's denied, poverty sets in for decades. 15% of the population of Cook County, Illinois, which includes Chicago, lives below the poverty line. That's 780,000 people. The national average is 13%. I'm an avid bicycle rider. Each year, I try to log between 2,000 and 3,000 miles, venturing through the neighborhoods of Chicago and her suburbs and into the nearby states of Indiana and Wisconsin. I even tried to bike all the way home to East St. Louis once. You can see a stark contrast between its affluent suburbs on the North Shore and its low-income communities on the south and west sides of Chicago where the poverty rate is even higher than 15%. In biking through Chicago's west side neighborhoods, you often see abandoned buildings, falling down fences, and empty lots, and not a sit-down restaurant in sight, and very spotty retail corridors. However, on the North Shore, you see big homes sitting on manicured lawns with thriving town centers. In one of the more affluent suburbs of Kenilworth, the average household income is $300,000 per year. By contrast, on the west side of Chicago in North Lawndale, it's $43,000 a year. Imagine what North Lawndale would look like if its average household income was $300,000 a year. I bet you you'd see at least one Tesla dealership on a few of those vacant lots and plenty of places to dine and shop. I've spent a great deal of time talking to investors and developers working to change their attitude about investing in low-income communities at the loan fund. What happens when investment is made in an area where there's a high concentration of poverty, wealth is created for those who've been locked out of economic progress for far too long. Take, for example, the development of the Jewel Osco in Woodlawn, a community on the south side of Chicago. This is the first grocery store in this community in over 40 years and it was constructed by an African-American developer born and bred on the south side of Chicago, Leon Walker of DL3 Realty. Why did it take so long? No one believed that a grocery store could make money in a community where 33% of its residents lived below the poverty line. No one believed that a grocery store could be profitable in a neighborhood where the unemployment rate was twice the national average. And we all know that more and more Americans are shopping online and even having their groceries delivered to their front door. And because of COVID-19, online shopping 
has exploded even more over the past nine months. Yet directing your dollars to retail and low-income communities continues to make good sense. The legacy residents of these communities have been starved for far too long. In the example of the Jewel Osco and Woodlawn, community residents continue to flock to the store. They've embraced it as a part of their community. When the civil unrest broke out across the country this past summer, Chicago saw its downtown and some of its inner city communities partially destroyed by fire and vandalism, but not this Jewel Osco. People in the neighborhood came together and protected the store with their bodies to make sure that it could continue to provide fresh fish, meats and vegetables, and other critical goods to the entire community, and jobs for local residents. Local residents are building wealth through employment stability. 200 people in the community work in the store, and over the past year, $13 million of investment has occurred right around the store. 30 local entrepreneurs are building wealth by selling their goods on the store shelves. Indeed, e-commerce is putting some pressure on retail all over the country. Yet, it can still thrive in low-income communities because there is so much pent-up demand as these communities are building back from nothing. In addition to retail, investing in low-income communities brings affordable housing, community facilities, arts and recreation, and so much more. Yet, it can also bring rising property values and increasing rents for legacy residents. Thus, money with the right attitude also seeks to prevent displacement that can be caused by this growth. Thus, this attitude supports affordable housing. Let's go back to Woodlawn. The nonprofit company Preservation of Affordable Housing, or POA, along with several community partners, is investing $30 million in Woodlawn through the federal government's Choice Neighborhoods Program. POA has developed 800 units of affordable housing, which has catalyzed additional retail, education, and cultural developments. 2,600 jobs have been added to the neighborhood, and over the past eight years, median incomes for residents has been rising. With affordable housing in place and all of these new amenities, seniors and adults who grew up in the neighborhood can now truly thrive. In its new home, Woodlawn residents can enjoy a hearty breakfast in Daly's Restaurant, a staple in the neighborhood for 127 years. Daly's now anchors Woodlawn Station, a new retail center developed by Money with the Right Attitude, which also includes a new UPS store. As a resident of the South Side, that UPS store has become my go-to for shipping, notary services, and all these new supplies I need for my home office. The owners of the store, Rex and Monica, a local African-American couple who also benefited from financing with the right attitude, are examples of wealth building by concentrating capital in one community without driving out current residents. Long-term investment in low-income communities requires not only money with the new attitude, but technical assistance. A couple of months ago, I went to the UPS store to take care of some business. And I overheard Rex saying to a customer, no mask, no service. When the customer walked out of the store, I asked Rex why he didn't have PPE available for his customers. And he said, brother, I just can't find any. I immediately called my team and asked them to find some PPE for Rex and Monica and to ship it to the store because we wanted to ensure that every resident of Woodlawn could continue to take advantage of the store services and dollars spent in the community 
could continue to build wealth for local small business owners like Rex and Monica. Long-term investing in low-income communities over time builds wealth and keeps people in their homes while feeling empty spaces with laughter and a sense of pride. Loan funds like mine are investing in a sustained and robust way in poor communities because we know that long-term is bringing economic justice to our entire region. Going back to when I was a kid, I didn't fully understand what my mother and grandmother did for a living. That they were redirecting investment to neighborhoods where it was missing. They knew money had an attitude. Does your money have the right attitude?